welcome everyone to the debut event for the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire's Global Tipping Point Speaker Series, Climate Change and National Security. We are absolutely delighted that you've decided to join us this evening. And for those who are watching on replay, we're excited that you're engaging with the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire's programming. We do hope that you are all staying well, uh, both physically and mentally, in these trying times for our country uh, and for our community. Um, with now, uh, as we all know, more than 200,000 Americans who have succumbed to the coronavirus, um, community support has never been you know, more important, and we hope to uh, provide just a little bit of that here uh, through our virtual series uh, throughout the Granite State. Uh, for those that I have not had the chance to meet, uh, my name is Maura Sullivan. Uh, I live in Portsmouth, and I am a proud board member for the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire. WACNH is a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization dedicated to helping people better understand the challenges that are facing the world today. In the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, it is more important than ever that our citizens understand the complex global issues that we all face. That is why the World Affairs Council is here and why we are so committed to bringing these timely programs to you. As a membership organization, the Council is supported by generous community of global citizens. Our programs are made possible by members and donors, ensuring the Council's good work can continue. We thank and appreciate everyone who assists the World Affairs Council and hope that if you are not yet a member that you will consider joining or donating to keep these programs alive. You can find out more information about our membership on our website and make a tax deductible contribution to the organization at wacnh.org and your help is greatly appreciated. We would also like to thank Rob Werner of the League of Conservation Voters for co-hosting this wonderful series with us and the Henry M. Jackson Foundation for their generous support as well. We would not be able to do this without both of these admirable organizations. In addition, we would like to thank our mission partner, Southern New Hampshire University, for all of the support they've provided over the past 20 years. Our council is stronger for your assistance. Also, as a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, the council does not promote a political position, party, issue, or candidate. We are here to provide a platform to, for discussion and hope that you will draw your own conclusions on the information presented. Therefore, the content of tonight's program contains the views of the speakers and does not necessarily represent those of the council, its board of directors, staff, sponsors, or members. Now for the good part. For those for whom it is the first time watching these events, welcome. We will be taking questions throughout the night uh, and really want this to be highly interactive. So please do send us your queries so that we can have a full and robust discussion after our speakers finish their opening remarks. You can send your questions to our email address at wacnh.org or to our social media accounts or use the messenger app on the bottom right of the website. Before I turn it over to uh, my friend, uh, Rob Warner of League of Conservation Voters, I just wanna say a quick note about our honored guests tonight. You know, as a former Marine officer myself, uh, an Iraq war veteran and a former senior Pentagon official in the Obama administration, I can't tell you what a treat that we are in for tonight in the Granite State to have Admiral Stavridis and Sherry Goodman and John Conger here. Um, we are just absolutely thrilled that they were able to join us. Uh, I had the chance to, to meet Admiral Stavridis uh, in Washington um, and you know his reputation and his leadership in the Navy uh, precedes him. Um, I was telling you before this call, uh, my husband, who is deployed and is a Navy Reserve officer, was just recently sent his book by my father-in-law. Uh, so uh, it's been a, we've had a, an Admiral Stavridis uh, book club as of recently uh, in our family. And I, I'd encourage all of you to, to kind of virtually join uh, as well. It's been, it's been wonderful for all of us. Um, so again, we want to thank uh, Admiral Stavridis and Sherry and John for being here. Um, we, we're, we're thrilled you made the virtual trip and are just looking forward to a terrific discussion. Um, with that, uh, let me turn it over to Rob, who will give a brief introduction and uh, introduce our guest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maura, and thanks to the World Affairs Council New Hampshire. It's a great partnership um, that we have with them, and we look forward to the series this fall. Um, so I'm going to introduce our speakers, and then Admiral Stravitas will uh, kick things off with uh, 
his remarks, but I'd like to do a little bit of an introduction. Um, Admiral James Trevitas is an operating executive with the Carlisle Group, following five years as the 12th Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Retired four-star officer of the U.S. Navy, he led the NATO Alliance in global operations from 2009 to 2013 as Supreme Allied Commander with responsibility for Afghanistan, Libya, the Balkans, Syria, counter piracy and cybersecurity. He also served as commander of the U.S. Southern Command with responsibility for all military operations in Latin America from 2006 to 2009. He has earned more than 50 medals, including 28 from foreign nations in his 37 year military career. Next, we have Sherry Goodman. Uh, the Honorable Sherry Goodman is an experienced leader and senior executive lawyer and director in the fields of national security, energy, sci uh, science, oceans, and the environment. She is a senior fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center and Center for Naval Analyses and the senior strategist at the Center for Climate and Security. Previously, she served as the president and CEO of the Consortium for Ocean Leadership and as the first Deputy Under Secretary of Defense for Environmental Security from 1993 to 2001. Finally, uh, the Honorable John Conger is Director of the Center for Climate and Security, where he oversees all of the center's programs and, and Chair of the Climate and Security Advisory Group. He is also a senior U.S. advisor to the International Military Council on Climate and Security. Mr. Conger previously served as senior policy advisor with the center and capped off a career at the Department of Defense as the principal deputy under Secretary of Defense. Uh, so we're excited about this program this evening. I think this is an aspect of climate change that uh, deserves much more attention. And so we're kicking off this series this fall to uh, to make sure that that happens. And we're very happy again to have our guests with us tonight. And so without further ado, please welcome our first this evening, Admiral James Darvidas. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my pleasure to be with all of you. And I'm gonna begin by uh, sharing a screen so that we can uh, just look at a few images and slides. So let me, uh, let me kind of get that where it needs to be. Great, so you should be seeing something uh, that says geopolitics and leadership in the time of Corona. And so what I thought I would do with my very brief uh, introductory remarks is kind of set the larger stage for what's happening globally. What are the security challenges? I'll certainly touch on climate, which I do believe is among the most uh, significant challenges we face. But I'm gonna do it again in a larger context and then wrap up with just a couple of thoughts on leadership because I know groups like this are not just about admiring the problem. Groups like this are about how do we energize leaders to help solve these kind of problems. So let's start by uh, simply looking at uh, an image here, uh, which you might think is a one of those pop-up hospitals in Central Park. No, this photograph was taken a hundred years ago uh, during the time of Spanish influenza. And I put it here to remind us of a context as we deal with coronavirus. We've been here before. We have had global pandemics and we can certainly uh, do what we need to to overcome this one. And in fact, more recently than Spanish influenza, at the top is Ebola, upper right is uh, patient zero who died in a Dallas hospital. At the bottom is Zika. We have faced global pandemic and medical situations as a society. And I think we'll uh, surmount this reasonably well over a period of time. Um, here's a snapshot of, of why this is challenging. And part of it is we don't know everything we need to know. So look at that graph on the left axis is the lethality. And it kind of runs from common cold at the bottom, people don't die of cold, all the way at the top, bird flu, MERS, Ebola, very, very lethal. Spanish flu, as you see, kind of in the middle. We still don't have a good answer to the question where on that scale uh, does coronavirus fit? 
Similarly, across the bottom is transmissibility. Far right, measles. You know, you look at somebody uh, who has measles and you're going to get it. Chicken pox, extremely transmissible. Polio, bad. Common cold, seasonal flu, less so than chicken pox. Again, um, I think we're learning that what we're going to find with COVID is it's actually lower than Spanish flu on the left axis, but more transmissible than Spanish flu on the right. The point is, um, keep a context as we look at this and look at global security and geopolitical challenges. So really the question that should be forming in your mind is, okay, Admiral, well, what do you think? What's going to happen as we come out of COVID uh, and make the turn into more challenges ahead that we're going to have to deal with? Well, let me start by showing you what I don't expect. This is what will not happen. We're not gonna have a World War Z-like event. Um, this uh, is a mediocre movie. It's a pretty good novel. It's not Brad Pitt's best work, but it's about a pandemic. It happens to be a zombie pandemic, but it is a pandemic in which the world essentially melts down. The global order falls apart. That's not what we're facing here, fortunately. But we will see some winners and some losers coming out of this pandemic. And I think one nation that is going to come out strong out of the pandemic is China. These are Chinese ballistic missile submarines, bottom right. I put Secretary Pompeo there. If you have not read his address given at the Nixon Library about four weeks ago, I'd encourage you to read it, to understand the trajectory, and it's not a good one, upon which the United States and China are embarked. And, and partly it's because of a term we've become comfortable with lately, and that's pre-existing conditions. In other words, even before COVID, if you look at US-China relations, we have significant disagreements, upper left and cyber, upper right, our militaries uh, always in tension, bottom right, trade and tariffs, bottom left, China building artificial islands throughout the South China Sea, in the middle, controversy about 5G networks, Huawei, where is the future of cybersecurity going? So we have all these pre-existing conditions to include most strikingly, in my view, China's territorial claims in the South China Sea, where they're building artificial islands, which is going to contribute to the tension. And frankly, whether we see a Biden administration or a second Trump administration, these tensions are going to be extremely extant. And we see the Chinese Navy, which now has more warships than the United States Navy, not as capable, certainly, but growing in size. And as the saying goes, quantity has a quality all its own. This is a Chinese uh, frigate paying a port visit, not in China. This is in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The Chinese Navy is on the move. Their cyber forces are highly active. They are using those cyber uh, skills to tap U.S. intellectual property. And one geopolitical muscle movement that I think you're going to see enhanced coming out of the uh, coronavirus situation is going to be a growing rapprochement between China and Russia. Bottom right, that's a Chinese frigate operating with a Russian destroyer. That's not a photograph taken in the North Pacific, where you might expect it, that's in the Baltic, in the Baltic Sea, in the heart of Europe. So China, I think, will come out strong, and they have contained the virus well, and I think that uh, they will be uh, energized, and I'm concerned about pressure I see them putting on uh, Taiwan uh, following the crackdown in Hong Kong. How about Europe, our closest pool of allies and friends? Um, certainly Europe will be in tension. I think actually Brexit, which I opposed at this point, let's just get it over with so the Europeans can continue to operate uh, with a, a cohesive central message as they have uh, trying to respond to COVID. I think NATO will continue to be uh, a strong factor in all this. So Again, China, I think, comes out of this 
strongly on the international stage. I think Europe, particularly the European Union post-Brexit, will be neutral, maybe slightly stronger coming out. How about the developing world? I think here is where we see real storm clouds ahead. That's India at the top. That's the golden temple of Amritsar, sacred to the Sikh faith. The bottom is Pakistan, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America. All three of these emerging markets are going to face real challenges because the healthcare system is not sufficiently robust. Um, and as a result, they will have to rely much more on herd immunity, their demographics, which are good, very youthful populations. But the challenges ahead are significant. And five of the six most affected nations in the world on a per capita basis with COVID deaths, four out of the five top are in Latin America and the Caribbean. The fifth, of course, is the United States of America. How about Russia? I think Russia comes out um, of this relatively neutral, more partnership with China ahead, that'll be significant. And how about these two characters? Uh, Iran at the top, North Korea at the bottom. They're neutral at the moment, trying to focus on containing COVID, particularly Iran, which has had a bad run. Uh, both are waiting for the outcome of the US election before making a move, if you will. They will certainly test uh, a new Biden administration. They'll push to get back to the bargaining table with a second Trump administration. Um, look for challenges here, not until after the US election. And then lastly, as we look geopolitically, how are we doing? Uh, we're doing poorly. And we're doing poorly because we've mishandled um, the virus. Um, we have responded too slowly, then we didn't close down long enough or early enough, then we reopened too soon. Um, now we're gonna see a second significant wave going through the fall. And the reason is this, it's political gridlock. We have managed to stumble into a situation where wearing a mask has become a political statement. And that is oh so wrong. And I say that by the way, as a political independent, I'm a registered independent in my native state of Florida. Um, I, I was interviewed by uh, Hillary Clinton and vetted to be vice president in her potential administration. And I was offered a cabinet post by Donald Trump. I kind of think of that as two bullets whizzing by my head, but I mention it in the context that we all ought to be concerned about the gridlock in the nation. That cute little girl on the bottom left who's wearing her Minnie Mouse mask is my granddaughter, Lorelei. So US, I think either way is gonna come out in a diminished international position. So let's, let's talk about the environment and the oceans because I think that is a, a, a basket of real concern that we ought to focus on. Uh, many of you will know, and certainly uh, Sherry Goodman, who's a, a deep expert on the oceans in particular, will tell you that it's 70-70-70 that 70% of the world is covered by the oceans, that 70% of our body mass is water, and 70% almost of the oxygen we breathe comes from photosynthesis in the seas. Um, the seas are vast, the Pacific Ocean alone, you could take all of the land mass on the earth and it would fit neatly inside the Pacific Ocean. Uh, recently, I've been rereading this extraordinary book, The World is Blue. It's by uh, the current National Geographic Explorer in Residence, Sylvia Earle, written about, uh, about a decade ago. And it's a prescient book about what's happening on the oceans. Um, clearly, at the top of the world, we're seeing the ice melting. You know, there are those who will argue about the causes and the effect and how to solve it. I'm here as a simple mariner on this panel who has sailed the waters of the Arctic and the Antarctic. The ice is melting. That's just a fact. That will open the top of the earth to geopolitical competition. Um, and who is on that Arctic front porch? On one side, 
are the NATO nations, US, Canada, Denmark by virtue of Greenland, Iceland, Norway. On the other side of that Arctic front porch, of course, is the Russian Federation. Tensions are building, ice is melting. Other nations who have no Arctic front porch like China are becoming more and more involved. All of this is part and parcel of the downward spiral of temperature, level of plastics, illegal, unregulated fishing. The oceans are the largest crime scene in the world and they will continue to be so until we collectively work on these very challenging issues. I wrote about that in particular in the book on the right, Sea Power, the History and Geopolitics of the World's Oceans. Um, all of that taken together is a pretty rich basket of challenges that I've outlined for us as we come out of COVID. Um, environment, in my mind, was trending toward the top of the list. Now, because of the pandemic, has re received a bit less attention. I think it will come strongly back as a top issue, if not the top issue for us uh, as we go forward. I'm gonna close in five minutes with a couple of thoughts about tools of leadership that we ought to be looking for in our elected leaders and that we ought to be seeking uh, and hoping we see in other international leaders if we're gonna deal with this basket of challenges. And you know, as I started to think about this, I tried to think about a US president who faced truly enormous near existential challenges. The list is quite short actually. It's George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Because FDR is the most recent president to deal with a basket of challenges, including the outcomes of the Spanish influenza, a global uh, recession that turns into a global depression with a D because trade barriers crack the global economy, leading to the rise of fascism and stumbling into a second world war in which 70 million people die. I think it's instructive to look at Roosevelt and think about his qualities of leadership. And if you haven't, by the way, read a biography of Roosevelt or focused on FDR since you were in college, go back and, and read about this really extraordinary four-term elected president of the United States. Um, he was calm under pressure. He was a brilliant communicator in an age when uh, Twitter was something a bird did and clouds were in the sky. He had only primitive rad radio and he captivated and calmed the nation with fireside chats. He was a consummate team builder who was able to bring together personalities as disparate as Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin and make it an effective troika. He was someone who was an innovator. He was unafraid to reach for the new, knowing that he had to hold on to the present, but was willing to entertain every new idea when it met the exigencies of the moment. Really quite a remarkable leader. And finally, he was a master of detail. You know, it's commonplace for a president generally can name all 50 states and tell you what the state capital is, tell you who the governor of every state is. FDR could name every county in the United States. There are 3,000 counties. And he could tell you the county seat. He could tell you who was the county commissioner and the head of the Democratic Party there. He was a master of detail as well as a remarkable strategist. We need more leaders like FDR. And as you look around the scene internationally, there are some good leaders out there. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen, upper left, the head of the European Union, Angela Merkel, incredibly principled. President Xi is a very effective leader. There are a lot of his policies I violently disagree with, but he is, he is a, an effective leader. Um, Bill Gates, I think, represents kind of the private-public nexus. We could talk about each of these, but it's hard to find a leader who really captures the package the way FDR did. Tools of leadership, innovation, as small as a post-it, big as a moonshot, 
as crazy as airplanes on ships. Innovation coming out of this COVID will be in the medical world. There'll be a military bounce that comes out of it. But this is where real innovation is going to happen. It's going to be telemedicine, the top on the middle right, teleeducation. And bottom, I think we all are realizing now there are going to be some fairly fundamental changes to the workforce and the workplace uh, that will come out of all this. So innovation, communication, which is not a megaphone. Communication is really a bridge. Our communicators need to be strong in this world. This is Facebook. The brighter the white, the higher the concentration of Facebook users. So communication alongside innovation. Third tool, collaboration. We're going to need to work together. And collaboration, by the way, is not, as is commonly thought, eight guys in a racing shell all doing the exact same thing. Real collaboration looks like this. These young ladies are in a peloton. It's messy. People fall down. They draft on each other. They compete. They collaborate. It's messy. Collaboration is messy. Whether it's got a structural format like the NATO alliance, or it's a coalition like the coalition against the Islamic State. 78 nations are in this. This is the future of international relations, is innovation, communication, collaboration, if we do it right. Just to wrap up, um, the ultimate layer of collaboration out there, of course, are these institutions, United Nations, European Union, NATO, the World Bank, World Health Organization, many others. When did they get on the scene? Well, about the time those Chevys in Havana arrived in the 50s and 60s. Some people want to just take those institutions and blow them up and start over. Mistake. They're kind of like those Chevys. They need a tune-up. They need some better parts. They probably need a paint job. There's a lot we can do, but throwing them away at this point would be a mistake, especially as we face enormous challenges. And here I really would put climate at the top of the international to-do list. Lastly, um, all of this rests on a bedrock of values, which come to us from the ancient Greeks, from the Buddha in the East. They drop through the enlightenment. That's the young Voltaire on the right. They come through our founding fathers to principal leaders like Angela Merkel. Values matter. All of this is hard work. Solving the climate problem, which really is the problem from hell, is going to require a sense of Sisyphus. And I'm Greek-American, so I'm required to have uh, Greek mythology in all presentations. Here it is. Um, it's going to feel in climate and in some of these other challenges, like the boulder rolls back down. But we've got to deal with it. we got to do it at speed, but keeping ourselves in balance. And last image we got to do it, hopefully. This image was taken about five years ago. These are migrants on a Somali beach on the Red Sea. And prosaically, what's happening? They're lifting up their cell phones, trying to get a better signal. Newsflash, won't work. But metaphorically, what's happening in this picture? These migrants are reaching for the light. They want to get to the next stage of their journey. They are hoping... They are hoping to move forward with their lives, to be part of this larger world. I'll close with a quote from Napoleon. Those of you who've met me in person know that I stand five feet, five inches tall on a really good day. I'm not that towering admiral out of central casting. I'm a short guy. So I like to quote Napoleon because short people have to stick together at all times. Napoleon said, a leader is a dealer in hope. If you remember nothing else from our evening together, I hope you'll remember that quote. A leader is a dealer in hope. That's the essence of what we must do to overcome the challenges that lie ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure being with you. Here are my coordinates. If you would like to continue the conversation electronically, I think we have plenty of time to uh, hear from two other really extraordinary public servants, uh, folks I've known and admired for their work in the Department of Defense, and then we can have a more fulsome conversation amongst all of us. Thank you. 
Thank you, Admiral. So I'd like to now turn it over to, uh, to Sherry Goodman and then she'll be followed by uh, John Conger. And then we'll have, uh, I have a couple of questions to pose to them in terms of having a discussion and then we'll open it up to uh, general uh, Q&A from the audience. So over to you, Sherry. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's always a great pleasure and honor to uh, share the stage with Admiral Stavridis. And I wanna thank you, Rob and Maura for organizing this event and all of you um, for participating. I count myself as a uh, New Englander. I was, uh, it was, I was actually practicing law in Boston uh, when I was first asked to serve as the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security in 1993. And I recall one of my very first meetings was a team from Pease Air Force Base in New Hampshire that came down to brief me and tell me how uh, they were converting this base that had recently closed, it had been on the base closure list, into they were cleaning it up and they were converting it uh, to what's now become a very important uh, logistics hub. Uh, but in those days, it was thought that closing a base was bad for the economy and difficult for the local community. And they were one of the first to show the way. Uh, so I, uh, New Hampshire has always had a place in my heart. I actually have spent a lot of time in Massachusetts. I have a home there, went to school there. My daughter went to school in Maine. Uh, and I grew up skiing in Vermont. My son goes to school in Vermont. So I really feel very closely connected to the region. And uh, you all either care about world affairs or you care about conservation and climate, or maybe all of the above, which is great. Uh, so let's get right to it. And I'm going to actually start by, by a comment on one of Admiral Stavridis's last slides, where he said that those Chevys, the Havana Chevys, need a little bit of a tune-up. Well, you know what they really need? They need to be electrified. Okay, so that's where we're going to go. Okay, now I started out my career... Um, in nuclear weapons and nuclear policy and defense and strategy. And I've spent my whole career as a defense professional, but because that those were the biggest problems of the day when I came of age during the Cold War. Um, but now, what do we see as the greatest global challenge we face? It's really climate change and now the collision also with COVID, the cascading risks that we face. So I say sometimes my career has gone from weapons to waste uh, and now to trying to save the planet. Um, so where, where are we see that these risks are not out in the future? About 15 years ago now almost, I formed a military advisory board. Admiral Stavridis would have been on it, but he was on active duty then, and we had retired uh, generals and admirals. Uh, and we, we organized ourselves through the Center for Naval Analysis and spent a year of study with um, with the leading climate scientists around the world. And we learned even then back in 2006 and seven that climate change would be a threat multiplier for instability. Uh, it, we thought then only in fragile regions of the world, little did we know what a here and now problem it really is. And we see today with the wildfires in California and the flooding in the Midwest and the hurricanes that have ravaged the Southeast that this is today's problem, not for the future. Uh, and now we see the risk compounded by the global pandemic we face, which is evidence really of a natural security challenge. So we've got climate warming at a, a rapid rate. I'm going to come back and talk about the Arctic in just a moment. But we also have a decreasing biodiversity loss uh, that is affecting us worldwide. And we know that the, the disease, the COVID uh, pandemic may have started through the spread of zoonotic disease there in that wet market in China. And so now we see a compounding set of risks. And then we also have our oceans, which are our sustainment, our vast, uh, uh, we need that for life. And we had just some terrifying news announced earlier this week uh, that the Arctic sea ice now which reaches its minimum annual extent in September is now at its second lowest ever. And 14 of the last years have seen 14 of the lowest sea ice extents. So what does that mean? 
it means there's actually a compounding effect as the sea ice melts and retreats. It opens up more black water, which then reflects more sunlight, compounding the climate challenge that we face globally. Uh, how did I spend my earlier parts of this day? Well, this morning I was on a dialogue with Russians uh, and Americans to look at how, we, how we're going to deal with matters in the Arctic. Uh, as the Arctic um, is becoming increasingly navigable, uh, Russia wants to use its northern sea route as a potential toll road for transit from uh, ports in Asia to from Asia to ports in Europe. It's rearming and nuclearizing its part of the Arctic. China envisions a polar silk road as an adjunct to its vast Belt and Road Initiative that connects the Arctic as well as ports in Asia and land and uh, land routes across Asia and and into Africa, uh, and declared itself a near Arctic stakeholder. Uh, so we have vast changes occurring, uh, and yet the U.S. Um, has yet to really invest in the kinds of capabilities we need to operate in a new and changing Arctic. Uh, the threat multipliers that we face are now numerous. You know, the, the extreme heat um, is one that is, is I think, an under-evaluated challenge, under-analyzed challenge. We see this now not only in the desert southwest, but in parts of India and the Middle East, there will soon be many days of the year when it is really too hot to sustain life outside of air conditioning. And we know that many in those areas don't have access to air conditioning. So now there's a group to, uh, that has formed to address an extreme heat alliance. Um, and we see that this is also affecting our troops as they train when there are more black flag days, they can't train. Our military bases around the world are at risk uh, from bases in Florida and North Carolina that got slammed with hurricanes last year to the tune of billions of dollars uh, to rebuild. Uh, and this is affecting our ability to operate all around the world. Um, so what can we do about it? Well, uh, you know, very notable, and, and and one thing you should all pay attention to is just uh, yesterday, a uh, Chinese president announced that they're going to a net zero emissions economy by 2060, okay, while the U.S. right now is on a path to pull out of its Paris targets, which uh, wouldn't even get us probably to that goal. But the Europe, now China, and others have set very aggressive goals to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. We're gonna to have to figure out as a country how to get back into that game. Many governors, many of your governors are, and you know, you've done a lot already to reduce emissions in your region. And there's a lot more that we can do as we look at how to energize America, how to build that clean energy economy. And I think you all in New Hampshire will be well suited with your talent, excellent workforce and technology innovation around many of the great universities and elsewhere to take advantage of those technologies we're gonna need for electrifying vehicles, carbon removal, um, carbon capture and sequestration. There's a whole suite of technologies that we haven't fully seized. You know, America has been, for the since World War II, we've had a vast set of research and development that's powered everything from our space exploration uh, to many of our defense innovations. Now we need to apply that innovative competitive edge into the energy and climate future. Clean tech and climate tech. It's on the horizon. It's in many of our universities. It's in some small companies. And now we need to use that to expand, grow good jobs in this country, and we can use it as a springboard uh, to the future. So if we do that, then we need and I'll, I'm going to close on this. I want to give uh, so we can have time for Q&A. The other key point is we need to work with our allies and partners. We have uh, forsaken them in recent years. We've talked about buying Greenland. Uh, you know, we've ignored our allies uh, at, at our own peril uh, because we can't go it alone. This is a global challenge and we'll only be able to rise to it if we come back humbly 
uh, and bring uh, our unique brand of engagement and leadership. I speak to many of our allies around the world by Zoom now on a regular basis, um, and they all are hungry for America to get back in the game. After my meeting with the Russians and, and the Americans this morning, in the middle of the day, we had a program on a, creating a North American Arctic research infrastructure. Because when you look at a map of the Arctic, uh, Greenland and Canada and the US all form geographically that North American Arctic. And like a string of pearls, like the former Dewline sites that used to run across Alaska and Canada, we now need to connect a research infrastructure so we can understand what's happening in that area, have the observations, the predictive capability, and the domain awareness we're gonna need for the future. Thank you very much, and I'll look forward to our discussion. All right, thanks so much, Sherry. Uh, I'll turn it over to John Conger for his comments, and then we'll have some uh, discussion. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here for uh, for one reason, I, I Sherry talked about being from New England and 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 that's wonderful. I'm from New Hampshire. I grew up in Nashua, uh, lived there for many years. Uh, my dad lives in Derry, so I have, I have family in the area, and it's just a uh, a delight to be back here talking to folks from New Hampshire. I, I can, uh, if I need to, drop my R's to to reflect my authenticity, but but I'm not going to do that to you. Um, I am, uh, I guess, in the cleanup position, and I wanted to hit a few points. Sherry did a great job of hitting a lot of the climate issues. Um, what I'd like to do is take you on a ride and uh, really get you depressed and down about the state of the world and then give you a few seeds of optimism. Um, <clears throat> so the climate is changing. We already see climate change happening. It is reshaping the world as we see it, and the change is inexorable. It's really uh, going to keep coming for many, many years, uh, even if we uh, started behaving on emissions today. We've already emitted enough into the atmosphere that for the next 30 years, we're looking at terrible things that are going to happen as um, uh, you know, we get more droughts, uh, more wildfires, uh, different storm behaviors, just dam and sea level rise, all sorts of damage is gonna happen as things change. Um, in an environment where you're worried about security concerns, it is, uh, it would be malpractice for the military not to see the world around it and to act in the world that it's living in as opposed to putting political blinders on and pretending these changes weren't happening. So in the world we're living in, the military has to accept the fact that uh, climate change is affecting our bases. Hurricane, you know, there was a, a hurricane a couple years ago that flattened T Tyndall Air Force Base, which is in the panhandle of Florida. Um, $5 billion worth of cost to recover, uh, both in uh, getting, you know, dealing with operational questions. We lost uh, you know, or had damaged several F-22s. Um, we don't make them anymore, so we had, you know, but we're fortunately able to repair them. But that costs money, too, in addition to the buildings and, and all the other recovery costs. Um, we've had other hurricanes that cost billions of more dollars, record floods um, that cost more. Uh, we've had what we've got wildfires out west, and while we haven't lost a military base to wildfire per se, we've had to evacuate bases um, almost every year for the last several years. Uh, wildfires come too close to a military base, and we have to get out. These the world is changing around us, and we have to accept that world uh, in the sense of being able to operate within it. I think it's very important to worry about uh, emissions. But uh, focus on emissions is only half a strategy. We've got uh, lots of other problems that are happening. And so from a military, so um, I, I uh, had jurisdiction over the military installations at the Department of Defense and, and did a lot of climate change in the last administration. I, um, so my focus was on how do you become more resilient? How do you make that base able to weather the storm or when wildfires tear through the area and take out all the power? How do you keep operating even though, um, you know, the grid is down? There are things that you can do from a, from a perspective of adapting to the new world we're in. And it's not a dirty word to adapt. It's not giving up to adapt. It's accepting that certain things have changed and this is the world we're living in. If we want things to avoid getting much, much, much worse, 
that, that we have to worry about emissions as well. But emissions is half a strategy, adaptation is half a strategy. So uh, as we start to worry about today impacts, that's one of the things that the military has to pay attention to. Sherry talked about the Arctic. I think worrying about what new missions we're going to have as, as these changes occur is going to be one of those things that we have to pay attention to as well. And so <clears throat> whether we have to patrol a whole new ocean in the Arctic, or we have to worry about increased requirements for humanitarian assistance and disaster response uh, around the world and in the United States, um, these are things that we're gonna have to start to pay attention to. Um, Sherry talked about uh, climate as a threat multiplier. Well, there are conflicts that are going to happen around the world. There is instability that is going to be uh, pressurized by climate change. And so you're going to be worried about uh, ec uh, economic impacts, human, human security impacts. Um, climate change is going to make parts of the world uninhabitable. Uh, you're going to have places where it's either too hot or the sea level rise will will uh, make uh, agriculture un non viable or there's islands which won't have any drinking water because the aquifer will have salt water intruding into it because of sea level rise, even if the island's not underwater. There's going to be affecting so many people and in, in many of those places, people are going to have to move and they're going to have to move to pe places where people live already. That's going to cause conflict. Um, there's there's just a host of problems that, from a security perspective, we have to keep our eyes open and understand the world in which we live. It's kind of like if you sat down to play chess and somebody started taking out squares of the board. You you need to be able to work around the changes that are happening in your environment and be ready for them. And if you can anticipate where those changes are going to happen, it puts you at an advantage. And if you decide that's not going to happen no matter what, and you're just gonna pretend it doesn't exist, it puts you at a disadvantage. So purely from a strategic point of view, you have to start thinking through these things. Um, is climate change the biggest threat that we have to face? Uh, I get asked that question a lot, and, and I, I would like to put it this way. Um, that's the wrong question. Uh, in fact, climate change shapes and affects all the other threats that we have to worry about. All the things that Admiral Str Stravitas went through in his presentation, um, China, how does climate change affect Chinese behavior? They are moving to uh, control more food and water supplies in order to feed their population. Uh, th how does it affect Russia? They are moving forces to the north to, to uh, take more control over and influence over the Arctic that's emerging as, a, as an economic opportunity for them. How does it affect the decision making of the mullahs in Iran where you've got heat that, that you know, goes the the record heats that they're having in Iran is, is having a devastating impact on their population. How does it affect uh, nations that are experiencing drought? How does it expect uh, affect developing nations that can barely manage their population as it stands, and suddenly the food supplies dry up? How does it affect the decision making of all of these nations around the world? That's the kind of security environment we have to to contemplate. It's not an either or. We have to start thinking about and, uh, and this is just piling on and affecting the environment around us. So um, with that cheery note, how, how, do, how, do, how do I think we're actually gonna be able to come out of it? Well, one is we have to be pra practical and pragmatic, realize changes are happening and be ready for them. So we have to understand what's happening. But then the other piece of this is we're gonna have to invent some solutions. We can all say that we're gonna to go to zero emissions in 10, 20, 30 years, but from a practical perspective, we haven't invented the things yet that we're going to need in order to accomplish that. And so in many respects, throw, um, we need to dramatically increase uh, our research and development here in the United States in order to be able to be at the forefront of that. We've done that before. We did it with the Apollo program when we thought that space was such a big national security issue, and it was. We've done it times when, when we weren't necessarily uh, even realizing we were doing it. In the 90s, we doubled the, the budget of the National Institute of Health to attack cancer. And, and those rates have, uh, you know, our ability to address uh, cancer treatments have, dr have dramatically increased. In the 90s, the NIH became a bigger science agency than NASA. Um, and so we can do this. Uh, and when we do it now, as soon as possible, that will have 
the longer term impact. When we create the solutions today, it will create uh, the better tomorrow. Uh, so with that, hopefully more optimistic note, um, I'll, I'll pause for questions. Great, thanks. So what we're gonna do is uh, bring everyone back, excellent. And uh, picking up on some of the comments that uh, the three of you have uh, put forward in, in your presentations. Can you tell can you tell us a little bit more about this how this threat multiplier aspect works and give some examples in, in recent history in terms of uh, how that's actually operated and uh, affected our national security. Jerry, do you want to do that? Sure. I mean well one one of the most uh, vivid examples is the prolonged drought in Syria that uh, has preceded the most deadly conflict of our, of the modern era, pre-COVID, let's say. Um, but the, there was drought in Syria going back to uh, 2005, and then again in 2010, that sent many farmers and herders who had lived together peaceably, uh, who then lacked water and were, and were unable to continue their livelihoods sent them migrating uh, towards the cities, which then led to civil unrest, inadequate jobs, and then the political unrest, the political conflagration, um, which was uh, obviously a negative. Climate isn't the only condition, but it has magnified those conditions. In parts of Africa, uh, prolonged drought has enabled terrorists like Boko Haram, and al-Shabaab to take advantage of vulnerable populations to recruit them because when people are desperate they'll do anything to protect their family uh, and to get food and water and shelter and so as the um, uh, as the Sahara Desert creeps further south uh, and destroys more communities and makes them unlivable more people are subject to the terrorist threats that ravage that region. Can I just add, um, uh, agreeing with Sherry's excellent examples, let's bring it closer to home, let's come to the Americas. Uh, here you have natural disasters, um, the increase of hurricane activity, the, uh, the effect on Central American agricultural populations, what ensues? Migration. And so uh, these, these are going to be uh, fragile populations, not only in Africa and the Middle East, but just south of the United States as well. And and just uh, just to add one more example from uh, the Western Hemisphere, and if you look at um, Venezuela, they, they were already a poorly managed country. And, and when you add the climate change impacts on the glaciers there, the water supplies uh, started drying up. Their poor water management uh, on top of uh, the fact that they had lower energy production from their hydro plants because the glaciers are drying up and then less water available to their people uh, created even more instability within their within that country. So there's, there's plenty of examples we could if we can Good. Um, yes, yeah, so I've, I've read actually read a uh, uh, reread a uh, article that was in New York Times magazine about migration that was published in the uh, summer it was really disturbing in terms of you know how is it that we're going to react to this are we going to re-engage in the world are we going to put up walls uh, people are moving from rural areas into the cities we'll do more so and then uh, this sort of band of uh, of geography around the globe that traditionally has supported uh, our human population and, and crops and so forth it's going to be narrowing and moving north so how do you see us reacting to this over the long term? What 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 do we need to do to prepare for this uh, as a country and re-engage in the world? Let me let me start going back to my days as Commander U.S. Southern Command, and uh, and, and let's let's look at that southern border of the United States. Um, and you know we can build a wall there. Um, it it would cost a lot of money, but we could build two thousand mile wall there. Here's a news flash, and I know this because I'm an admiral. Right to the left of the wall is an ocean, <laughs> and right to the right of the wall is the Caribbean Sea. People will find ways to get around walls, no matter how big and how massive they are. So 
to where we start with this conversation, we need to address these challenges so people do not feel they need to engage in uh, life disrupting migration. Let me make a second point very quickly to how should we react to it. We ought to also be intensely sympathetic to those who are refugees, who are forced into these kinds of situations. And I say that not only because it's the right thing to do and it is what our values ought to be about. Germany has taken in a million refugees from Syria. Uh, their population is about 80 million. Here in the United States, we've taken in a few thousand. But there's another reason to be sympathetic to these populations, and it's a pragmatic one, as follows. How much grit and courage and sincere effort does it take to put your two-year-old daughter on your back, grab your four-year-old son's hands, and walk across Syria, somehow get across the Aegean Sea, and end up in Germany? I want that person on my team. That's the Hunger Games. And there is real value in embracing many of these refugee populations. And yeah, I get it. There are all kinds of countervailing arguments in terms of domestic politics and the difficulty of doing so. But you watch in Germany, that first generation will come and open shawarma shops. Second generation will be doing startups. Third generation will be running BMW there is a value in these refugee populations. Having said that, the first order solution is to help with the challenges at home so people don't have to undertake these forced migrations. If I could add to that, you know, my, my parents were Holocaust refugees and they were fortunate enough to escape from Germany in the late 1930s. And I'm, I'm the first born child. Uh, and so I, as an immigrant, you know, from an immigrant family, we, we are a nation of immigrants. And uh, we've seen that and, and we've seen the power and the success of that. So we can either build walls, which is what we're doing today, or we can build bridges to a better future. And we can do that through education, innovation. The innovation we need to solve the climate crisis is the same type of innovation that's going to create jobs for the next wave of of immigrants, whether it's here at home or whether it's better solutions um, for water insecurity that's faced by many around the world that's driving them to migrate. I think, I think just to add to that, we can't assume that the migration we're seeing today is the upper limit, right? I, I think that as you contemplate the challenges that we're going to have in the coming decade, there are gonna be much larger populations displaced uh, whether they're in the Western Hemisphere or, or the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, Bangladesh is going to have, you know, 10 or 20 million people off their coast displaced within the next 20 years. Uh, you're going to have other populations in the Middle East or in India displaced. Um, and yeah, Central America. The, the, the right answer in dealing with, with the Central American issues is not to cut off aid, which is, you know, an instinct of the more aggressive, uh, you know, policymakers, I guess. I don't know exactly how to characterize that kind of action, but it's counterproductive. Um, you, you need to come in and increase aid there in order to address the issues. But, but in some respects, this isn't going to be something you're going to be able to hold off. You're going to be have, you're going to need to be able to plan not this year, not this decade, but long-term for these kinds of problems and think about what is my long-term strategy for, for these issues? Because this isn't gonna be the last wave of immigrants. And, and, and I think you, you know, the United States as a nation, which is a, a patchwork of lots and lots and lots of different backgrounds is more, uh, more set up and more designed to accept those people than, than lots of other countries in the world, which are more homogenous. Um, I, I think we need to think very strongly about whether we want to have a, 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 a more planned em immigration policy where we can accept a larger number of folks. We have to think that through in advance. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pose a, a question closer to home and then we're going to go to audience questions. But uh, the closer to the home question, what do we, what are we doing 
Uh, what more do we need to be doing about our own military infrastructure here in the United States? You take a place like Naval Base Norfolk or other facilities that are under threat from various aspects of climate change. What kind of investments and leadership do we need to really uh, put those uh, bases and infrastructure in a better place than that seems to be um, over the long term if things continue this way? All right, I'm gonna go first on this one because I used to own the installations. Yes. I could talk for an hour and I won't. I won't kill you with that. Um, but, um, let, let's do a, a real quick version of, um, you have to you have to think this through and you can't just dump money into places because they won't know where to spend it. We have to be able to do planning in each one of these places and find out what your vulnerabilities are and identify projects. You also have to stop being stupid you don't want to be able you don't want to be building vulnerable facilities that are going to be at risk within the next 10 years in in low lying areas without any sort of protection you want to be thinking about these things in advance and start taking some of the zero dollar decisions that save you money in the long run um, as at the same time uh, shoring up your gap and to be one example of a zero dollar decision that made a ton of sense and that was when they constructed the billion dollar strategic command building at Offutt Air Force Base they built that building, that billion dollar building, up at a higher elevation. They built it up, at, you know, for, it might have been dumb luck, but they made a decision to, to not build it at the lower elevation in the floodplain. Well, just a year ago, the Missouri River overflowed and did a billion dollars of damage to Offutt Air Force Base, taking out about a third of the base. If they had built that building in the lower lying area, it would have done a ton of damage. They built it in the higher area and they avoided hundreds of millions of dollars of cost. Um, th those are the kinds of things we need to be thinking about in advance in order to be able to avoid some of the problems. Okay, I'm so happy to add on to that, but if you have ahead. other questions, you know, the watchword the watchword really is how do we make our bases uh, and our city more resilient to the ravages right. of climate change. And, and how, how are we going to do that? Well, uh, the first principle is we have to have, um, we have to have the right set of standards because weather is not stationary anymore. The climate has changed. And so the sea level has risen, the storms are stronger, um, the rainfall is more intense. So we have to build new buildings to better standards as John just referred to. But we're also going to have to do a lot with our legacy uh, in inventory. Of, of many of our buildings are old. Uh, we're going to have to make some very difficult choices. Uh, and we have to work with the community. You know, in Norfolk, they have sunny day flooding. And people sometimes can't get to the base, from their home to the base to go to work because the streets are flooded. So the communities have to work together. It is a, a, a problem not only for the military, but for the military in partnership with the community and that's going to be the case uh, all around the country right the only other thing i would add to that is you know it's not just the department of defense as an issue here it's really the entire u.s government state government local government so my additional pitch to the excellent points uh, john and sherry just made we need to think of this as an interagency problem and um just as uh, DOD, which is, you know, the elephant in the room always uh, has to kind of hopefully lead on this kind of thing. Um, we need to think about the rest of the U.S. government, the federal government, the states. There's work to be done um, in this category at all of these places, really taking John's point. It's about planning and looking ahead. Um, you need to connect the dots with the rest of the government as well, I think. Can, can I yield myself 30 seconds to cap that off? You also got to worry about the community outside the base because we rely on those communities for energy, for water, for wastewater, for transportation, for you know, civilian employees. If the base is resilient, but the community is not, the base is still in deep trouble. Good point. It's all connected. Um, let's go to audience questions. So first up, if the U.S. chooses to become a leader in green innovation and green technology, how will we prepare to transition people from fossil fuel jobs careers to green technology jobs so we don't have the economic disaster of experience for people working in the coal industry? Well, there are many good plans out there. For example, 
Uh, the first one, the e an easy one, is that we have too much methane leakage uh, from our oil and gas wells today. And although we're not going to be able to get off oil and gas right away, one thing we can do is reduce that leakage. Those are good jobs that can be at capping, reducing the leakage from those wells. That is part of the transition, taking the oil and gas workers rather than building new wells, enabling them to cap our wells. There's also many good training programs. Uh, one that I'm particularly involved with is the Veterans Advanced Energy Program that trains veterans uh, to move into, the into various advanced energy fields from batteries to microgrids uh, to renewables. Uh, but there are others and there are, the demands are growing. The jobs in the, in the clean energy industry are growing at a much more rapid rate than they're growing in most other industries, particularly in other parts of the energy industry. And so with the right kinds of both R&D investment and with investment in a clean conservation core, uh, citizens energy and environmental core, we can revive what we did so well during the New Deal, put people to work um, with good jobs and training. It's all possible. And I think New England is well placed to take advantage of it. We've got great workforce around Portsmouth, um, around all the major universities, certainly in um, around Boston area and also in Maine. A lot of great innovations coming out of the Portland area and other universities in Maine in recent years. If, if I could just add one more thought, you know, th this change is going to happen. It's not an if it's not a it's not necessarily even tied to government policy. These changes are going to happen. And, and you know, the car companies aren't, aren't even developing the next internal combustion engine anymore. They're working on how to make uh, electric vehicles. In 10 years, it's only going to be electric vehicles on the show floors. So, so as you think about the changes that are coming, you, you need to get ready for them. It's not about whether we, we hold it back. And sure, when there's transitions, you know, there, there should be transition assistance without question. Um, but, but thinking about it ahead of time, doing, doing that preparation now is, is very important. I'll add that um, there are good lessons to be learned here looking at our partners in Europe. Uh, the Germans, the Swiss, the Scandinavians have a remarkably good apprentice type training programs that we lack here. This could be vested in our community college system, which is, uh, in my view, very underweight in terms of preparing people for 21st century next economy kinds of jobs. It can also be enhanced by private public cooperation, incentivized through tax policy, and uh, to both John and Sherry's points, um, a, a tranche of this will be in the environmental space, but it, it really goes across uh, healthcare, uh, biodiversity, ecological work, construction, uh, materials. This really is a broad-based structural set of educational changes that we need to enact here. And I think um, people are inspired by working in ecological and environmental ways. I think that can certainly be a part of it. We need to look broadly. Europe's a pretty good model in this regard. Yeah, just to add uh, a specific example of Admiral Stavridis's point, when we closed um, more bases in 1993, among them was Charleston uh, Naval Shipyard in uh, a naval base in South Carolina. And at the time I was working for Secretary of Defense uh, Bill Perry and we traveled with a congressional delegation to South Carolina to visit the base and visit Charleston. And the very first stop we made at his insistence was at the local BMW plant so that um, so that local leaders could see this type of apprentice program at work in a German company, but with American workers who were being trained in advanced manufacturing techniques. And he wanted to show the community that there were other good jobs, good manufacturing jobs to be had outside the military base. And now, you know, when you look at most of the military bases around the U.S. that closed a quarter century ago, they're an engine of growth in their communities without the military there today. Right. Next question, how big of an issue may ownership of the Arctic grow to be between Russia and NATO with the melting of its ice? 
Uh, since the word NATO is in the question, maybe I could start. Um, it, it's a huge, huge issue, unfortunately, in terms of the militarization of the Arctic. We had to do everything we can to avoid uh, geopolitics and military activity uh, drifting, if you'll permit a nautical term, into that, that vast uh, Arctic Ocean. But I think realistically, um, we're going to see challenges. Um, Sherry alluded to and, and very, I thought, very articulately laid out um, how this will unfold as the ice melts. Uh, there'll be competition for these sea lanes of communication. There'll be pressure to harvest more hydrocarbons from that region. And, and just to give you the geopolitics of it from a NATO perspective, as I mentioned, uh, up there are five NATO nations, United States, Canada, Denmark, because of Greenland, Iceland, and Norway. Um, and they run kind of a spectrum. The Canadians who refer to this as the high north are kind of high north, low tension, uh, really want to use the Arctic Council, really want to do everything possible to really take the temperature down. Um, on the other hand, the Norwegians who have been pressurized by the Russian Federation over a number of territorial issues have a much more forward leaning stance in terms of NATO activity up there. As Supreme Allied Commander, what I tried to do was kind of steer the ship in between those two positions, increase our surveillance up there, increase capability of allied nations to operate, but at the same time, active conversations with the Russian Federation. And we tried to use the Arctic Council as a, uh, a convening authority to have those kinds of conversations. Look, the Arctic Ocean is the only place on earth we haven't had a naval war at some time or another. Let's hope we can keep it that way. I'll close by saying it's worth looking at the legal norms kind of built into Antarctica uh, and how that has been handled. It's not a perfect analogy in any sense, but there are some lessons there for multilateralism, which is really the answer up north from my perspective. Well, it's, you know, um, just to build on that, you know, the Arctic uh, is an ocean with less and less ice. And Antarctica is actually a continent. It's a land also with less and less ice as uh, the ice sheet has melted. It, it is governed by a treaty. In the Arctic, um, um, under the law of the sea treaty and claims by the sovereign nations that are the Arctic, five, the Arctic uh, five nations with actual Arctic coastline, there act, there's actually not very much disputed ownership. There are some claims, in fact, even the US and Canada have a boundary dispute uh, that will at some point in the future be adjudicated uh, through the UN Law of the Sea Tribunals. I, I don't think the U.S. and Canada are going to, going to come to blows over that. The issue of ownership is, is less the um, issue of tension in the Arctic than um, the increasing proximity of um, military and other forces as the Arctic Ocean opens and is more available for surface traffic. Uh, both, the U both NATO with the U.S. and Russia in the last year have conducted major exercises, uh, either in the what's called the European Arctic High North, uh, close to the Russian Northern Fleet, which is where they keep uh, their main nuclear submarine force and their, their formidable uh, fleet. And also the Russians conducted an exercise uh, off the um, close to Alaska, off the Bering area not long ago, uh, buzzing some Alaskan fishermen who were deeply concerned that they, you know, might get entangled in this. So the concern that I have, I sometimes people say, what keeps you up at night in the Arctic? My concern is of an accident or a miscalculation, that we will misunderstand each other's signals, um, or that uh, a ship will have a collision or have run into a problem and within the vast Arctic, the search and rescue capability we need uh, to get up there won't be available. The Arctic Council, uh, which is the governing body for the region, has done a good job in addressing a range of issues from oil spill prevention, search and rescue agreements, and even research and development. 
it has no mandate to address security issues. So as military forces increasingly are present in the region, Russian, U.S., um, and others, and our NATO allies and others, we need some way to have what we called in the Cold War sort of confidence-building measures and early warning mechanisms uh, so that we don't find ourselves in the situation where it's hard to de-escalate and uh, where we don't where we don't want to be. I think that's possible, um, but we need to be, enable. And what's happened is there were security forces that were having a dialogue until about five years ago, when um, Ru the Russian invasion of Crimea uh, severed all of the mill-to-mill communi -mill communications that were occurring between Russia and U.S. NATO forces in the region, and that's made it difficult to come up with the right kind of mechanisms to, to enable this kind of these tensions to be diffused before they escalate. Thank you. Um, question about the structure of the DOD in the United States in terms of, I know that obviously there are reports and a lot of work that's done around climate, but how bought in, uh, so to speak, our, our, our career military and uh, civilian leaders in the Department of Defense in terms of the uh, work around planning and really taking this issue seriously. Um, Admiral, do you want to go first? I, I think it is, uh, it varies. And, you know, there are just like in any population of uh, 2 million people, which is roughly the number of people working across the department. Uh, there are some who are uh, very much in tune with what needs to be done. There are some real uh, throwbacks who just say, nope, that's not my issue. I'm gonna bang my sonar through the oceans. I don't care if uh, seals or whales or porpoises or dolphins uh, crash ashore. You know, there are, there are uh, deniers in the military just as there are strong proponents of this. So I, I think it's it's difficult to kind of categorize the force. I will say, I, I wanna just put a, a, a laudatory check mark to a recent official, uh, Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mabus, who was eight year Secretary of the Navy, one of the longest serving, who really put uh, climate and what the Navy could do in terms of improving its posture at the top of the agenda. Unfortunately, that's been less of a priority, shall we say, with the Trump administration. But I think just as society is kind of coming on and waking up to this, I think the military, broadly speaking, is beginning to get it. I'd be curious what uh, John and Sherry think from the civilian career force side of this as well. Sherry, do you want to go next or should I? Oh, God. You go okay. first. So, so, so I, I would make a couple of observations. Uh, in my time in the building, I would say that when we started talking about emissions, there was not necessarily enthusiasm. It was another requirement, um, but, but where we could make the energy efficiency or renewable energy something that was in the uh, was a benefit, you know, save money or or whatever, and that the emissions reduction is a co-benefit. That was that was just fine, and we made some progress. I think where we really got some traction though was when we started looking at the impact that climate change was gonna have on mission. When when installation commanders were starting to look at what flooding was doing to their bases or what storms were doing to their bases, that, that sort of thing got more traction. When the administration changed, I would make this observation that Secretary Mattis actually came out fairly early on with a with pretty strong language Thing that he thought climate change was was a serious concern and that the department had to take it into account that allowed that gave top cover to a lot of folks but but I, but I don't know that um, that they were uh, going at it full steam I, I, I think that they were allowed to go about their business and it was more like they took their foot off the accelerator than they put it on the brake so so work has proceeded but but perhaps not with the same enthusiasm that it had previously. Sherry, do you have a comment? No, I think there are many in the military today and many civilian national security professionals who want DOD to lead by example on climate and clean energy. 
either because they personally care about it and they care about it for their families and their future, um, or they know the power of DOD as the single largest federal energy user to use its buying power to advance clean energy innovation or to develop innovative um, technologies and conduct demonstrations. I mean, in the eight years I served in, in the Department of Defense, we went from being seen as an environmental laggard to an environmental and clean energy leader. And I don't think DOD has lost that today, as uh, John said. You know, it, they they some have gone uh, sort of underground or euf euphemisms. I say a lot of what I try to do today is keep hope alive with the good people that are working um, throughout our federal government to do the right thing. Uh, and we want those we want those public servants to continue to give their life and their um, and their professional experience to this. And, and by the way, this is where a career civil service makes so much sense. I mean, you have very talented people like John and Cherry who come into government, but then they, they move up to other pursuits. Maybe they come back, back and forth. Those career civil servants who spend 30 years as civilians toiling in those vineyards, um, I think that's where you can make money because uh, it, it gives you the continuity of policy, at least to the degree they can manage it. Okay. Uh, next question uh, is the fu is the future of mass migration of sinking island nations being seriously discussed in places of power? People will have to go somewhere. I think the island of Kiribati is, comes to mind. There was a film that actually the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire and mm -hmm. uh, League of Conservation Voters uh, screened last year. So, um, what's your reaction to that uh, that dilemma? Well, I'll tell you how it's, uh, I know Admiral Severinas has had command in Southcom and in NATO, but I, in discussions I've had and in, in a pro project that we've done at, at the Wilson Center uh, over the last um, year, part of which is with PACOM, the Pacific Command, they're out there trying to engage with our, um, uh, with Kiribati, with the Marshall Islands, with Micronesia, with, with the, um, Confederate, uh, confederated uh, states there that are U.S. territories because they see increasing encroachment by China uh, throughout now not only the, the eastern Pacific but into the western Pacific closer to Hawaii and that China is increasingly offering to provide um, disaster assistance, what we call humanitarian assistance and disaster relief and the U.S. needs to be there uh, the president of Kiribati, who was at one of our programs, a former president, Tong, he's already bought property in Fiji because he knows that a good portion of his country will not be inhabitable within the coming decades. And, you know, now they've also recognized uh, they just changed their affiliation, their um, diplomatic recognition uh, from Taiwan to Beijing. So that is happening across the Pacific. So we need our presence there. Uh, and we need it as much to be able to counter China's influence and also to address, and their number one issue is climate change and the existential threat that they will face uh, in coming decades. I'm just going to add one point, not so much about uh, rising sea levels taking out islands, kind of the reverse. It's China's construction of artificial islands which is going on with increasing rapidity in the South China Sea. I touched on this very briefly in my presentation, but China claims essentially the entire South China Sea as territorial waters. That would be like the United States claiming the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea as part of our territorial seas. Um, mm -hmm. It's a preposterous claim, which has been rejected soundly uh, by the international courts, but China is going to continue to press it forward. And one of the ways in which they're doing it are building artificial islands. Um, my good friend, Admiral Harry Harris, mm. formerly commander of US Pacific Command, talked about the Great Wall of Sand, which is building these islands out of sand. Many of them are going right over coral reefs. Uh, and these are big entities. These are thousands of acres. They have airstrips, missiles, tanks, 
soldiers. Um, it is an ecological crime, and it is also a violation of international law, and in my view, uh, a, a clear violation of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, the Law of the Sea Treaty. So um, China is on the move, exactly as Sherry says, trying to woo these uh, islanders whose islands are going away just ironically, perhaps, it's worth noting, on the other hand, they're actually building islands in the South China Sea, which are having a great deal of environmental impact and damage. And I'll just add 30 seconds of thought. It's not so much that the islands are going to be underwater. I think it's important to recognize that the drinking water is at a lower, uh, usually at a lower level, and you're going to have salt water getting into the drinking water. So the islands aren't going to be able to support human habitation much earlier than than the actual uh, homes or anything is underwater. Right. Um, two final questions I think we have time for. Uh, one has to do with sort of the our the stress on the general biodiversity of the of the globe and how does that affect human population, which in turn affects this whole aspect of of security and are there any meaningful solutions to try to uh, impact that that situation? Well, um, I, I've written a little bit about what about a concept of natural security, which includes recognizing the biodiversity loss that is affecting us globally, um, and that does affect our entire ecosystems on which we live. Think of uh, the Amazon. Uh, which is home to so many endemic species and is being burned at a rapid rate. Uh, parts of Indonesia, even parts of the Arctic now uh, are changing. And, and this affects not only um, what, what we think of as wildlife, uh, but it does affect human health. And we're going to see more rapid spread and increasing uh, incidents like this pandemic um, when we fail to attend uh, to the loss of global biodiversity and how it affects us. John, go ahead. Uh, I, I guess I'd just add this thought that, that this is all interconnected. And so um, there are ways that the loss of biodiversity, you know, which is a value in and of itself, but there are ways that's going to add pressure to, to places as well as just another aspect of, of climate adding stress to uh, various parts around the world. It might have impact on ecosystems and food supplies uh, or, or have a other uh, other dramatic impacts. So I think um, it, it's you can't just sort of write it off. I mean, it, it, it's more uh, interconnected than we can see right in front of her. I'm just going to add, uh, we, ought to, we ought to spare a thought here for the oceans in particular uh, because of photosynthetic processes that produce the majority of the oxygen that we breathe. With, with all due respect to Al Gore, who called the Amazon the lungs of the earth, no, the oceans are the lungs of the earth. And if we upset that uh, biodiverse element that is part of the photosynthesis, largely plankton, um, due to acidification, due to rising temperatures, uh, all of the things we've talked about tonight, um, that's the really dark end of the spectrum uh, for for human life. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Ocean ocean health is critical and a part of global biodiversity. Ab absolutely. Um, final question: uh, What's the number for each of you? What's the number one urgent concern that you have for climate change? And uh, my addition is: Where's the hope? Uh, I'll go ahead and go first then if nobody else is, wants to. Um, uh, so I think my biggest concern, my mo most urgent concern is, is the step function event. So whether it's an extreme weather strike on a, a major population center or a glacier uh, uh, going in and suddenly raising sea levels by two feet um, or more, uh, that there are uh, going to be a sudden event that you don't have time to prepare for it is out there in its roles of the day. Um, there are a lot of gradual things going on that we will have time to prepare for if we take the time to prepare for them. But it's the, it's the surprises I don't like. Uh, those are the things that, that make me 
uh, a little bit nervous. And, and the hope in my mind, the hope comes uh, from the fact that we can't, we have been able to invent and innovate our way out of many, many problems. And if we focus effort on something, uh, we can usually solve the problem. I think that frankly, we're going to be able to uh, innovate our way through this carbon emissions issue, even if it looks like there's no way to do it today. There will be a way tomorrow if we focus our attention to it. And and, um, and that will transform the way this problem works. Sarah? Well, um, I, I agree that the, the greatest challenge of climate change is that the pace of change is now exceeding humans' ability to adapt to it. Um, and we see that with the wildfires, the flooding, the hurricane, the severe Arctic ice melt. Um, with planning, we can become resilient and adapt. Um, and we can do that. The hope is the vote. <laughs> Um, I'm going to put in one last plug for the oceans, says the Admiral. 70% of the world, um, the potential uh, is high for solutions that can occur there. On the other hand, as I just laid out a moment ago, the really dark end of the spectrum would be something that interfered deeply with photosynthesis in the sea. Um, I think all of these challenges we've touched on and talked about tonight deserve our attention. Uh, for me, uh, given I spent 37 years in the Navy and 11 and a half years day for day on the deep ocean out of sight of land, um, I think the oceans matter incredibly for the world. I agree technology is part of the hope. I agree the vote is part of the hope. I think it's really leadership um, and it will require leadership to get the United States back into a global leadership position in climate change and on many other things, um, that will be essential. I'll close by saying we've talked a bit tonight about the tensions between the US and China. Think how powerful it would be if we could work with China on the pandemic, on the global economy, on resolving military tensions in cyberspace. Above all, think how powerful it could be for the US and China to work together on these kind of problems. That's my hope. Well, thank you very much, the three of you, for joining us uh, this evening. It's been a really robust discussion, and thanks for sharing your expertise and your perspective with us. Um, I want to remind folks that our next program is October 14th, and we'll have uh, former Navy Secretary Ray Mabus, who's been mentioned tonight. Uh, we have author Jeff Goodell, who's written an interesting book called The Water Will Come, which I would recommend to you. Yeah. And Norfolk, Virginia City Councilor Andrea McClellan, who does a lot of work with the Naval Base. So very uh, good. An interesting program, and, and perhaps uh, the three of you could tune in as well uh, next month. But again, thank you for joining us, and to all of our audience, uh, thank you, and uh, have a good evening. Be safe.